Here's a place where all of us can be safe. Our stories of transformation can be safe, and all the things we want to research are safe here. This is Safe Space with Cheyenne. I'm really excited you're here, and I hope you stick around for a while, because I've got a lot to show you before I leave Earth. I love you guys. Welcome back in on my Safe Space friends. I have George Lunsford today. He's from North Carolina. Sorry if I wasn't supposed to say that, but I wanted to know where your accent comes from. Um, he's an author of Legends, Myths, Monsters, and Ghosts, the USA edition, and he is also the host of Odd and Unusual Tales. And um, he sure has some stories here that I can't wait to hear just based on his biography on his website, but I really appreciate you coming on the show to share all of your fun findings of the paranormal and such with us. Thank you for having me. I appreciate it. Yes. Yeah, so, um, off the record, before we recorded, we said that uh, one of our first paranormal experiences that we had both came from our great grandmother. So, I would love for you to start your story and just tell us all of your travels and tales and what you've encountered. Okay. Uh, well, my first paranormal was in my late teens. I was in a bed of sleep probably around 3 o'clock in the morning or so. I felt something, so I woke up, and my great-grandmother was sitting on the end of my bed. But she looked like translucent. She didn't look normal. But I could smell her perfume. And she was talking to me, and she said she wanted to come by, and told me goodbye, and that she loved me. And I was, you know, wasn't nervous, wasn't afraid, just like she was really there, you know. So we talked, and she told me, and I told her I loved her, and vanished. So I went back to sleep. Well, the next day after I got up, I found out that she had passed away. And I was thinking, was this some kind of a dream? But then I walked back in my bedroom, and I could still smell a perfume. So I knew it wasn't a dream right there. And uh, it just, I haven't had any, I've had a few interesting uh, paranormal things, but nothing scary. Mm -hmm. now, That's always good. I know some people have scary interactions, and it just pulls them far away from ever wanting to experience anything again. Well, the creepiest one I ever had was at a friend of mine's house. At the time, he lived in this house. It was built in the 1800s. And in the basement, they actually had cages built into the walls. And there was something evil there because you could feel it. Oh, and it absolutely. even seemed like the like shadow person there mm -hmm. moving around. And it was it just pretty creepy. Yeah, I haven't experienced anything creepy like that. So the one thing that I thought was creepy, which turned out to be like kind of sad and like I wasn't scared anymore. I lived in this house in Quincy, Illinois. It was probably um, 108 or 110 years old when we moved into it. And um, we were going around the house when it was empty. The landlords were showing us, like, this could be your room. This could be your room. So there's, mm -hmm. a, there's a room all the way back at the end of the hallway. And me and my roommate at the time, we were like, this is my room. This is my room. This is my room. Like, we're just jokingly fighting over it. And then we open the closet, and there's a little boy in there hunkered down, looking at me scared, like, ghost white face. Like, he just looked like he was super, super sick. Um, and I closed the closet door and I said, you can have this room. I'm out of here. <laughs> <laughs> that I, could, I do not blame you at all. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I was like, okay, so check. So when we moved into the house, um, we were told that the grandmother of the girl still resided, her spirit still resided in the home and she won't, she's not evil. She won't play any tricks on you, but she's here to make sure that you're safe and the house is safe. So she's like, I would light candles in the living room and I would walk into the kitchen to come out. She's like, and I would come in and the candles would be blown out. And I knew it was my grandma immediately because my grandma was a stickler about not having candles lit outside of a room that you were in. So even when we were kids growing up in this house, you know, we'd come over, light the candles in the living room, go into the other living room, and grandma would always walk in and be like, what did I tell you, what did I tell you? So, like, they always knew that the things that were going on were because she would do the same things when she was alive in their childhood. So I was like, oh, okay. Cool. I was like, okay, that's cool. Like, I've lived in haunted places before. I went to a haunted nail school down on, I think, Main Street in Quincy as, as well, which actually that was a scary experience, but we'll get into that later. 
Um, so I was like, I can deal with grandma. Like, I, f I freaking love grandmas, right? This is going to be great. Well, it ended up we had grandma. The mother of the son was also in the house. The son was in the house. And then grandma would appear to be older. And then she would appear like her older self that passed away that would blow out the candles. But then she also would regress back into her younger self in a Victorian format. So like a right. very like lace up dress, right? And this is my favorite one about grandma. So I had a boyfriend that would come stay at the house. And I don't know if it was the times where you don't have unwed people stay at your house or what. But I woke up at like 5 a.m. to my boyfriend just like shaking in cold sweats next to me. Again, I know my house is haunted. I've seen ghosts forever. So I'm just kind of like, you're here. If you're evil, like go away. If you're nice, you can stay. Just don't mess with me, right? And he's laying there and he's like, is your house haunted? Like, do you have ghosts in here? And I was like, yeah, the, I told you, like, the grandma that lived in this house still lives here. You know, we honor that. And he was like, she came up to the side of my bed and grabbed my foot and said, get out. Get out of here. And he's like, I can't. I haven't been able to sleep. And he's like, I'm never staying here again. And it took me, like, he... I think would only come to the house in like the daylight, but he never stayed at my house again after that. And I like, after the relationship ended, I was like, thanks grandma. Thanks for that. Like he'll, he'll know not to mess with us next time. But, um, yeah. Other than that, do you know anything about like ghosts being on like time loops? Like where they redo the same stuff over and over. I could skip a record. Yeah. Yeah. So one year called the, uh, the uh, pink lady at the at the uh, Grove Park Inn. Oh, okay. She repeats the same thing over and over again. Okay, perfect. Because I've seen other stories about it, but I didn't know if you had encountered it. So, um, the mom and the son. I I wish that I would have just looked up what type of sickness went through. But basically, a plague went through Quincy, Illinois. Right. So it was the time where like. They didn't bury the bodies. They burned the bodies. So if somebody died in the house from the sickness, they had to throw the body out on the street and then wait for the cart to come pick up the bodies to go burn them. So, Sounds like consumption or black plague. Yeah, something like that. But I can't really think of, like, the time, so I don't want to, like, misquote it. So I'm like, this is, like, this is what they did. Because there was a sickness where they buried them and then realized that – you know, it killed everybody again because it went in through, like, the drinking water and all of that. So then they're like, we'll just burn them this time. So it was the burning sickness. Um, anyways, so the little boy in the closet was actually, like, he had passed away. But he had actually hid in the closet um, because he was so sick and he was scared he was going to die. So he would either hide under the basement stairs. And we had to, we had to like, go do laundry in the basement. And I'm telling you, like old creepy ass yeah there's shit in this basement for certain when you walk down there so I rarely did laundry by myself and every time I walked down I was like hey please don't trip me going down the stairs or anything like that because you know you could like see stuff come up you know and again it's more like third eye I don't want people to think that I could actually see the boys apparitions I could see like a third eye presence the mom was an apparition so we'll get to her creepy ass in a minute god bless her soul right um, oh, yeah. so the boy would get sick and he would hide under the basement stairs and then he would run back from the basement stairs all the way to the bedroom that I told you about. And he would hide in the closet and I'm pretty sure he, that's where he died, but I'm not a hundred percent positive, but that's why when we opened the door, he was standing there shaking because yeah. like, he was hiding. He didn't want to die. And he knew if he died that he would be left out. So they, she had to take her son's body and put it on the curb and then she walked back and forth in the kitchen over and over. And she would open the blinds to see if his body was taken. Because it would take them, like, I don't know, up to a week to grab the body, right? So, one, I would, I'm like a couch surfer queen. Even though I had a sweet king-size bed upstairs in my house, I would just always fall asleep on the couch. And at the same time every night, the shadow from the kitchen would wake me up. She didn't walk into the living room because this is an older house. So it's kitchen, dining room, living room, but it's like big, you know, what I'm talking about like beautiful Victorian closed doors. Um, and I would, I would see the shadow and I would just, you would feel, you would feel her presence. And I was like, oh, I really hope she doesn't come and peer over me. 
So if I didn't <laughs> if I didn't wake up, she would come in the living room and she would peer over me. And I would wake up and she would disappear and go back into the kitchen. But for the most part, she was on a time loop in the kitchen where she would walk from where I assumed she was making tea and then just consistently walking over to the window and opening the blinds and seeing if her son's body had been taken away. So my friend was in the kitchen one night making food and she screamed and ran into the living room and she goes, who's the woman in the black dress? And why the hell didn't you tell me this place is haunted? And I was like, oh, I'm sorry. That's the mom of the little boy. I was like, she's stuck on a time loop. And like, I don't really know what to do about it, but just honor the fact that she wants to live in the house. So we would close the blinds and we would come home and the blinds would be open. Like she always like touched the blinds to open them to see if she could go see her son's body. But she would walk to the window and then her son would run behind her up the stairs. I'm the only one in the house that either one believed it and two saw it. Cause I think the other guys were just like, whatever, like they believed in grandma and they might've yeah. seen other stuff. But I was like, I'm on board with this. Like, I respect you guys. I I will not try to sage you away or anything like that, but I respect your story. And that's probably, like, some of the biggest activity that I actually had to live in because Grandma would walk up and down the hallway, and there was a creaky board right where my head my headboard was. So every night at the same time, if it wasn't the mom downstairs, it was Grandma walking up and down the hallway so I was like, I ended up having to move my bed to the other side of the room, which then puts me right in front of the creepy door to where you can see the like handle jiggle like a horror movie, right? Or you see the shadow of them because there was a window outside the door. So yeah. her apparition would walk by and the shadow would go by. And I know both my roommates are in bed and I'm like, it's okay. You live in a haunted house. This is totally fine. Like, just it's totally cool. Like Quincy is like a very, very haunted town anyways. I know that because when I was a kid, I used to read books on all of the hauntings in just the tri-state area. And there were so many in Quincy that I was just experienced with. Like I knew what parts of town I could go to. Being clairvoyant yeah. really helped me out, but not knowing I was clairvoyant worked against me at the time because I was just like, this shit's creepy. But um, yeah, those are probably like the creepiest ones I would say. Well, like nice creepy. I had like a weird creepy thing and I'll just interject that in later down the road if you bring up some like bad spirit because I think you'll really enjoy that one too. But that one still creeps me out and I usually have to like light my sage when I talk about it because it's like one of the darkest things that I've ever experienced. But it also like reaffirmed again that that was real. That actually happened. You can see this stuff. Yep. Yeah. So grandma... Later on, you got a sickness and you're in the hospital. Was that the next time that you had some, like, a near-death, out-of-body experience? Uh, well, that happened, but my high school was haunted. Because oh, okay, it was built yes. on a graveyard that they hadn't finished moving. I just watched a <laughs> Scooby-Doo episode yesterday with my daughter about this. <laughs> <laughs> well, they, they paid this company to come in and move the bodies. The graveyard was for the poor people and the indigent people and, you know, whoever needed it. It wasn't a, it wasn't a fancy graveyard. They didn't keep real good records. So they hired a group to come in They supposedly moved the body and they started building the high school. Well, they started, they got up towards the, um, they started, they found bones and stuff like that as they were building it and they found body parts and all kinds of stuff. But when they started building the uh, uh, music area, they stuck the scoop in there and lifted it up. There was bodies hanging from the scoop, body parts. So they had to stop their thing, and they brought another group in, and they were supposedly moved all the bodies, and they, they continued to find body parts and bones and stuff. And there's still bones and stuff over uh, probably closer to where the football field is and in the ground. But... uh you could always see shadows moving or hear somebody walking, there's nobody there, or, or you know, door shut, maybe a disembodied laugh or, a, you know, something in the background. But you know, kids don't really think about it. You just mm -hmm. kind of go with it and blow it off and not really think anything about it. Mm -hmm. But, yeah, I had a near death in my 20s. And uh, I'm, I don't like going to the doctor. I hate going to the doctor. Yeah, me both. I didn't go and didn't go, and 
when I finally went, the, the uh, nurse practitioner said, oh, you just got bronchitis this time. Two days later, I was in the hospital. My lungs were half filled with fluid. I had 104 fever for two days. <laughs> and I was lethargic. Couldn't couldn't even set up. I was just... Mm. And uh, they got to me to the hospital. Took me into the emergency room. Everybody was going crazy. Got me up to a room. Well, that night, it was, it was early morning, late night. I woke up. And I looked up the clock, and the clock wasn't moving. The second hand wasn't moving. The clock was doing nothing. There was a woman standing beside my bed, an old woman, an older woman. And she said, it's okay. Calm down. There's nothing to be excited about. And I was like, well, I'm not excited. I don't know what's going on. She says, well, you're on the other side. It's fine. There's nothing, nothing to bother you. So I sat up in the bed. I got up. I looked over, and my body was still in the bed. And I was talking to this lady. I looked in the corner, and it looked like an angel over there. He was kind of grayish. You could see the outline. You could really see nothing to his eyes. Had the most piercing blue eyes you've ever seen in your life. It was just calming. It's real relaxing. And all of a sudden, people started coming into my room through the wall. And all these people come in, and I was talking to them. I wasn't scared. I didn't get excited. I real calm. An angel raised his hand up, and when he did, the light popped up. And it, all of a sudden, it went, boom. And it was the size of one of the walls. And people started walking, telling me by and walking into this light, this portal. And uh, I, everybody was gone except for me and the lady. And I went to go forward. She grabbed me. She said, it's not your time. Lay back down. So I said, Okay. <laughs> One of our laid back down and looked, and she waved by to me. She walked into it, and he put his hand back down, and the, it, everything was gone. The clock still hadn't moved. Then I laid back down. All of a sudden, next thing I know, there's alarms going off. People come running into my room, and they're freaking out. And a woman jumps up on my chest like she's going to give me chest compression. I, looked, I said, what are you doing? And she just went blank. She just looked at me like, what? <laughs> oh, and, the monitors were probably saying you're like code blue flatlining, and then you were actually yeah. able to respond, which doesn't happen. Right. <laughs> now I'm just stopped, and they all looked at me. They all went pale, and they left. And I said, I started asking about the people that come in my room, and all them people. The old woman had died in my room before I got there. Interesting. <laughs> And the other people had died in the hospital that day or that night before. So I wonder if they were all waiting for that light to present to them, and that's why they were able to, like, go in all at the same time. Because I've heard when people are, like, near death that more, like, dead people that haven't crossed over will actually come to visit them because they mm -hmm. know that the light is coming to them soon. That's why I understood it, yeah. Yeah. That used to happen to my grandma before she passed. And I think I think people thought she was going a little cuckoo in her time just from living by herself. But I would call her and I would just be like, are you ready to go? Like, let's talk about it. And nobody wants you to go because, you know, your grandma. But, you know, who's in the house? Who's talking to you? And she was like, oh, well, my mom came and talked to me the other day. And then... My husband came and talked to me. She's like, I talked to my father last night for 30 minutes. Like, just of sound mind, she knew what she was saying to me. And I said, I don't have any proof that this is happening to you, but I'm going to treat you as this is fact. And, um, yeah, I mean, she passed. And still to this day, I believe, like, there were just good swarms of souls around her just kind of waiting because, again, they – they, they're waiting, right, for whatever reason that they didn't go into the light at their time. Um, I have a hypnotist friend that has kind of a statistical analysis, and the highest percentage that he said um, of why people don't go in the light is because they think they're going to go to hell based on what their religious beliefs are. And then right. when, like, he, because he also, like, finds them and crosses them over, whether they're earthbounds attached to people's auric fields or, like, places and houses um, he's like, you're going to go back to the all you're going back to unconditional love and what God truly is and not what 
the word has been corrupted over time. So when you go into that light, like it feels good. It feels warm. It feels like home. So, okay, the light's going to present itself and you have to go. But I always thought it was weird that, you know, a lot of the religions that teach us like, this is the way, this is the way. It's the reason that people are like, nope, I'm going to stay here in the fourth dimension and just mess with humanity. I'm good. <laughs> I think they can cross back and forth. Do you? I really do. I think they can. See, I figured, so I like that perspective, but I'm going to elaborate on it what I think it is. So I think that you can get stuck in the 4D if you don't go into the light first. But if you go into the light, then that's your passport. Right. right? Because you've actually went over, so now you like, it's like an authorization piece. But if, right. you, if you're one of those people that are like, oh, crap, I didn't go into the light when I did, then I think that's what makes them go search for other energy sources to yeah. then go back up. Um, again, that's just my opinion. I don't have to be right. That's just from my experience and my research, what I have noticed about people coming and crossing over. I've had oh, loved ones. Yeah. yeah, I've had loved ones that come back and, like, they'll visit at certain times. Um, oh, my favorite. I'm so glad we get to tell these stories today. Oh, this is so exciting. So my mom actually sent me to a psychic medium when I was back home. And if you call yourself an anything in spirituality, I will definitely sit in front of you and open my mind to you. I mean, obviously, like if you're a dark arts practitioner, we're probably not going to talk, right? But, right. you know, if you, you're you of the light and doing of service for the light, I'll be happy to sit and talk with you and, you know, compare notes sometimes. So I was sitting there and she was telling me about all these loved ones that were coming through and talking to her and she had to describe them to me um, because a lot of them, um, they could talk to her telepathically, but it was, it was a very faint connection with the older ones is what I would say. But I had a friend die when I was, oh my gosh, like 22 or 23 and um, I had always thought that he was with me. Like, I just, we had a quick connection when we were physically incarnated together. And when he left, I didn't really grieve his presence as much as I should have. But I found out later I had a terrible time with grief. So I just shoved it down and never did. So I actually grieved his death, um, like, eight years later when I was going through, like, my whole awakening process. And um, I was sitting at this table and she said oh my gosh, I'm so, I'm so filled with like joy and laughter and I'm so giddy. And like in the back of my mind, right? Like my intuition was like, I think Cody's here. I think Cody's going to talk to you. And she goes, okay, I'm going to say a phrase. He just keeps repeating it over and over. And he's just saying, tell her she'll get it. Tell her she'll get it. And he, and she goes, I'm just going to say this. And I hope it makes sense to you because it does not make sense to me. And I was like, okay. And she goes, I'm a bangle. I'm a bangle tiger. And I was like, oh, my God, it's Cody. And it was like some silly story that happened to us way back when we were kids. But it, you know how like some weird phrases just become like code words for your friendship? So like that was our code word. If we ever like got on or off the phone or saw each other, I would like run and jump into his arms. And we'd be like, I'm a bangle. I'm a bangle. And we just start like rolling around doing a bunch of funny stuff. So like nobody knew that. Like that was our thing and my little sister's thing at the time. Well, my ex's little sister, but you know how it goes when you get those in-laws. Um, oh, yeah. And um, I was like, well, I mean, Amanda's still alive, and she's not anywhere near here. So um, she's like, he came in to tell you that he actually drives for you a lot. And I was like, what are you talking about? I'm like, I'm a great driver. And she's like, no, what, what he means to say is she goes – Think about how many, like, near-miss accidents you've actually had. She's like, and then, like, immediately, like, a timeline of, like, really close calls, right? Like, coming around a corner too fast and being able to slam on my brakes in time and avert all of the traffic in front of me. Or I remember my engine stalled one time in Kansas City in a car I was driving when I was taking a left when I was pregnant. And I honestly should have been T-boned by this car just based on science alone, right? And, like, I just remember, like, knowing at this time that Cody had fixed something in the engine and, like, made it go. And she was like, he's in your passenger seat, and he comes in, and he just, he's just there for you, bud. And that's, like, his thing was like, hey, bud, hey, bud, hey, bud. So the fact that she was able to, like, not only pantomime him and, like, express 
the essence of his soul to me in this reading, but also like literally give me like the the secret code to our friendship. I was like, oh, thank you so much, you know, and I'm a believer, like, don't get me wrong, but I'm also a skeptic when I come up and meet, like, new readers, because you have no idea who's actually out there, like, pretending to do it and actually doing it, so I do, like, I do lead with skepticism and all the things that I go out and research and do, I don't just come in, I'm like, oh, yeah, I believe you immediately, I'm like, I, I have a vetting process for my own boundaries and discernment and intuition process, and... I will be seeing you again, ma'am. Okay. <laughs> Which I had a lot of really, really good experiences. I love going and talking um, and having people who are crossed over come back for me. I know that I could call them in and talk to them. I just, I love the experience of being with mediums and having that talk and learning like who's even standing behind them and guiding them. Cause it's really good practice for me too. That's why I work at holistic fairs now. Just so I just think it's like the perfect training ground to, harness the energy of collective consciousness for your gifts and then practice to go out and like help. Um, I still get kind of creepy when dead people show up at my house uninvited, which it is kind of like the shadow people that don't know where the hell they are. And yeah. then my daughter's three. So she's really coming into like her third eye stuff. So she'll be like mommy. And I'm like, tell them you see them, you love them and go away. I was like, I'll let you know. I'll let you know if your aunt comes back to visit or your grandparents. I was like, but honey, sometimes shadow people just show up. They're freaking everywhere. I was like, the people that act like they're not there, cheers to you, friends. Cheers to you. But they are all around. <laughs> okay, so let's see. After you had this near-death experience, like, were you telling people about it afterwards? Like, no way. Not I kind of kept myself for a lot of years. Yeah. So when did you start? I mean, I know it said that you've always been fascinated with, like, paranormal anything, mysticisms, UFOs, cryptic creatures, all of that stuff. I'm all right on board all, with yeah. all of that. Yeah, I've always loved it, even before it became, like, real, right? Like, yeah. I just told you I was watching Scooby-Doo yesterday with my child. If there's anything I can pass on to my kid, it's music and Scooby-Doo, right? Yeah. Um, <laughs> But I remember looking back and just thinking, like, all the shows I used to like when I was a kid were all, they had something to do with paranormal and mysteries or things that just couldn't be explained. Um, yep. I mean, even something as simple as Unsolved Mysteries. If you get oh, yeah. the 11 a.m. show, that. it's missing people and murders. If you get the 11 p.m. show, you are tucked under your comforter going, why the hell am I watching this at night? But a lot of great ghost stories on that, too. And I've always been fascinated. I've always been called to it and, like, read books about it, all of that stuff. So I know that you've still had the same thing. But then incorporating your experiences into it, when did this become, like, a passion to travel and learn more and, and keep experiencing stuff? Because I know we have, like, a Bermuda Triangle story and some UFO stories to get into. But I'm trying to, like, build a timeline in my head of when you're, like, I've made the decision that I'm doing this and this is, you know, what I'm going to expand on in my reality. Well, I, I don't do that. I just take life as it comes. Yeah. I don't really play anything. Like when I started writing, when I started acting, say, when I started acting, I just said, I'm going to start acting. And I did. I went out and found an independent guy that was making movies and making films. And I went to work for him as an actor in about 20 or 30 shorts. Then I did all kinds of commercials and I did feature films. And I did all kinds of crap. Then I said, okay, I'm going to be a writer now. So I started writing. I love that. <laughs> I'm just, whatever hits my fancy at the time is what I'm going to do. I think that's great. You don't have any inner critic that tries to hold you back or you just like piss off, I got shit to do. Uh, yes and no. Mm -hmm. See, I grew up, my uncle was a big, he's a big sci-fi guy, and he's a big um, science fantasy. He has an entire room of just books. I would go in there, sit down, and read, and read, and read, and read, and read. I've read R.E. Howard, and, you know, C.S. Lewis, and J.R. Uh, Tolkien, and all this stuff I read all the time. Edgar Rice Burroughs was one of my favorites. And uh, we watched all kinds of sci-fi movies and science fantasy, and that's been stuck in my head all my life. So I guess I'm kind of, I just take everything as it comes. I don't try to force it. 
I just enjoy life. That's all you can do is enjoy life. Life's too short. That's some so really I just advice. Pop there it goes. <laughs> yeah. Okay, so tell me about um I read something about the Bermuda Triangle in your biography. What's that story? Yeah. Well, we was in the Isle of Navy and we found we was in the edge of Bermuda Triangle right above uh, Puerto Rico. I remember that. Mm -hmm. And we found a F fourteen tail fin. And we pulled it out of the water, and, and it looked like it had been cut laserly, like with a laser. It was perfect around the edges, not sharp or anything. And in addition to that, we were out at sea, and I was on a half lookout. And uh, it was a beautiful day. The water was like glass. It was just as smooth and beautiful as it could be. Temperature was perfect. It was just a wonderful day to be at sea. And... Uh, the forward lookout reported something on the horizon. On the horizon on the ship is about 10 miles. He sent a gray dot, it looked like. So I leaned over the side of the ship and I'm looking. And I see it. I didn't really want to think in that back because we've seen fog banks and stuff like that pop out in the ocean. As we got closer, it got bigger and bigger and bigger until we were probably three or four miles away from it, and you couldn't see the top and you couldn't see the sides. It just took air like a big wall. And as, we, as the ship went into the fog bank, the compass just started spinning. We started losing power, but we had some inertia. The ship just kept going forward. And as it came out the other side, everything would kick back on. And I'm on that flip out and seeing it coming at me. And we get into the fog bank, and I can feel right, like the electric pulses on my skin. And it's just, it's real dark, and all of a sudden it pops back out. And the water's choppy, it's kind of a hazy day, and everything come back on. Now look, and there's no fog bank, it's gone. What does that do to your mind at that time, right? Because you're like, I, I literally experienced it, I felt it physically on my body, and then everything just dissipates immediately. So... Two part question, right? Like right after you're like, "Whoa, are we all crazy?" But then the further away you got from the event horizon, was there anybody that tried to talk you out of that experience? No, everybody was so confused about what happened. We were just checking equipment and make sure everything was working. Mm -hmm. We checked even our sound power phones. You know, we wire sound power phones when we're out on walk. It's such a chest. You mash the button, you talk into it, and wire the headsets. Even they didn't work at the time when we was inside the fog which doesn't make any sense. But everything was fine after we got the fog, except for the water and everything. The atmosphere of the whole area changed. But everybody was so busy about the ship, I forgot about it. Oh, man. But did they, <laughs> were there, I mean, obviously, if you're sailing in that part of the world, like, Kind of like sailors back in the day, they're like, hey, we're going out this way. And they're like, you know, there's like a huge octopus out there that eats ships. You know, like, <laughs> was there ever any talk like before you guys went on these missions? Like, oh, hey, we're just going to, you know, be over here around the Bermuda Triangle. Anything you guys would like to tell us? And they're like, yeah, none of your equipment works when you go through it. And nobody knows why. No, not really. You don't, you go through it so many times. We went through it hundreds and hundreds of times. With no incidents at all. That makes so sense. So it, it's just, it happens every now and then. It's mm -hmm. not consistent. So you don't fear it. You just get surprised, and then you start making sure everything's working when you get done with it. <laughs> yeah, I used to be obsessed with hearing stories about the Bermuda Triangle when I was a kid. Just, I mean, I think, honestly, I probably heard about it the first time through Unsolved Mysteries, which was like a pilot driving through the clouds. All of this stuff starts going crazy. But then over time, like, because I was an avid watcher. Like, I mean, I had a schedule. If I was out of school, I was watching Unsolved Mysteries at 11 a.m. every day on Lifetime, right? And I probably was making, like, some type of, like, soup because it's, you know, takes, like, two minutes to make so you can sit down and, like, eat your food with it. But I just remember, like, building kind of, like, folders in my mind subconsciously. And I was like, there's a lot of Bermuda Triangle stories out here. And this wasn't at, like, the very advanced internet stage where you would, like, go to Google. 
I think it was Ask Jeeves at the time, and even then you didn't go ask him anything because, like, it just wasn't there. Like, I still was very book-oriented when I grew up, so I'm like, I'll find a book and I'll go research it. I'll find a book and I'll go research it. So I spent a lot of my time in the library in any of those sections that I could find with that type of information. But even then, like, I don't know how the librarians felt about like a fifth or sixth grader coming up and being like, do you have any books on hauntings, Bermuda Triangle, ghosts, paranormal? <laughs> it was a very Catholic community I grew up in. And I mean, I know yeah. that there's like Baptist, Methodist and everything else, but I mean, clearly very Catholic where I grew up. So um, not a popular topic even at the public library, right? Like the section's probably like this big. Yeah. <laughs> So, I mean, thank goodness for the internet and, like, the the way that information can get out to us. Because the kids that are growing up these days, like, if they have a question, they have, I mean, libraries from all over the world at their fingertips. And I was over here riding my bike and getting home before dark so I didn't get in trouble. So, they don't know what they have, do they? I agree with you 100%. Yes. And, I mean, I guess everybody has that in their time if you look back at it from, like, a previous generation. Like, um, I know my grandpa would always be like, do you know what we had to do to get food back in the day? Do you know how far we had to walk? Da, da, da. Like, you know, with the advancements of everybody, we all kind of look spoiled the more we come up. So I feel like I'm aging myself a little bit, picking on the younger generations about the research, but I am a little jealous. Well, you're, you're a lot younger than I am, so I'm not going to say anything. <laughs> oh, age is just a number. We're all just souls and vessels. Am I right? I was. I remember the land. land. Okay, well then this is really <laughs> gonna piss you off. So I was at. Um, I was at. Oh, my friend pulled me over to this building that she was clearing out, and like, these people collected everything under the sun, and she found these old like, little photos. I don't even know what they're called. Super little. You have to like put them up into a little like Kodak mm -hmm. camera to look at them. Microfish. It was, right, all the rage, right? And I'm looking at it like, oh, this is so cool. This is so collectible. I will look at it. And she had a box that said moon landing on it. And I was like, son of a bitch. We got a piece of history here, folks. <laughs> so I take that shit home to look at it. And it, the woman had taken pictures of the moon landing on her TV. And I was like, okay. Like, I, I can respect the times and understanding, like, you want to do this. Um... So, I mean, I guess that kind of dates both of us. Like, you were able to watch that. I was able to watch another one in school. I can't remember. It wasn't the Challenger because that was the 80s, and that was super sad. But it was – maybe maybe it was – who cares? Who cares? I can't even think about it right now. I just remember they strolled the TV and the VCR, you know, all, like, bunch of oh, yeah. like the, And they're like, we're going to watch NASA shoot something up in the sky, and it's a big freaking deal. Woo, go America. But literally, it escapes me, like, what mission it actually was. So, I'll move on from that. Okay, so Bermuda... I watched the uh, shuttle missions from the ocean. Do what? I watched the shuttle mission take off. We set off the coast of Florida and watched it. Oh, I bet that would be so pretty. That and seeing a volcano from a distance, I think, would just be <laughs> life-changing. And maybe yep. the Aurora Borealis, but that's totally on the list to go and, like, stay in an igloo and watch that as well. I have a lot of things I got to do before I finish this incarnation. That's what I think. <laughs> um, and I feel like you did, too, because you have some, like, super cool stories, especially the Bermuda Triangle one, which, again, I really did feel like I was watching an episode where I'm like, what is going on? <laughs> by the way, I think you'll really enjoy this. And this could be updated by now, but... Um, there is supposedly a stopping point with science of how eels actually reproduce. And science actually believes that eels migrate to a portal in the Bermuda Triangle and go to another dimension and have babies, or the babies come out of this portal. I haven't ever heard that, but okay. Google it and tell me how far you get with it. Because I did a little bit, and then obviously I stopped because I was like, oh, this is dimensions, portals, and the Bermuda Triangle. Okay, I'm here for it, but, like, let me give myself some integration time. And then, like, I don't know if I can even, like, pull up the paper that does it, but it was some scientist talking about dimensions, and he was like, if you don't want to believe in dimensions, he's like, how... 
How are you going to believe that science right now doesn't even know how eels make other eels? He's like, I literally <laughs> read a paper where it said they go through a portal in the Bermuda Triangle, and that's where they come out of, because they were trying to prove what species on Earth are actually not from Earth or from other dimensions that have crossed into our dimension. So they're yeah. talking eels, um, I want to say barracudas, praying mantises, dragonflies, like they were just, they're like, all of these things aren't actually from Earth, they're from other portals and they got here. And that even feeds into someone's research about um, like Bigfoot. That they're like, Bigfoot's elemental and people, and this is just like one person's research, so I'm not saying this is fact, I just love bringing up all different types. But they're saying um, Bigfoot is seen in so many different places and like he's there then he's not and he's there then he's not one because he's a telepathic teleportic creature but also he's interdimensional so if he's on a mountaintop at one time and then he's not off a mountaintop the next time to us humans like we're like where the tracks go where did he go they just disappear all the time and they're like he can portal jump like he's an interdimensional being and if those two, like, if they overlap with the earth, so to speak, they can jump in and jump out whenever they want, which again explains why they've been seen everywhere, but there's no, there's no, like, caves, migration, like, all that stuff, you know? And I have friends that have actually, like, had encounters with, with even, like, white Sasquatch, because they are, like, experiencers, I guess you can call them. Um, okay. and I've just decided to believe everybody's stories because it's <laughs> just more fun that way. You learn more, you're open-minded. It connects you more to your intuition, the divine, in my opinion. So, um, my friend had a, an experience at a UFO convention, um, with a white Sasquatch communicating with him. And there was a guy who was presenting all of his research on Sasquatch and he was like hey I'm having all these weird experiences out at this like cabin I'm staying at why you know I present my stuff and he's like you're kidding he's like I've been trying to get him to communicate with me every year I come out here he's like and he will not communicate with me and my friend was like well apparently you're trying too hard because <laughs> this dude won't leave me alone out where I'm staying so I just thought that was cool um again the eels the interdimensional stuff and us having no freaking clue what's actually going on, which is my favorite part about talking about all this stuff. Nobody does. Nobody. They, may say they know what's going on, but nobody knows what's going no. on. No, <laughs> but I think it's cool to kind of like consolidate all the experiences we do have. Like we're two of eight billion perspectives, so for us to not like not include what we've experienced in our reality, I think it would be a disservice to humanity. Because I always think, especially with, like, the huge awakening in human consciousness is what you're seeing all over the world right now. And it will continue to happen. Like, I feel like a lot of the generations that have come in before us, us and ahead of us, well, like, the babies and such, like, we're, like, really on a frontier of something that's never been experienced in the, in the universe at all. So I just think it's great that all of us are out here and we're like, this is what I experienced in in my human experience. Here you go. Like, take it as it is. You don't have to believe <laughs> it, but you should kind of open your mind because there's a lot more going on than what we were told when we were growing up. Oh, yeah. Yeah. I agree with you. Yeah. I don't think we know a quarter of our real history. Oh, absolutely not. And you know that just because every time they find a new site that, you know, carbon dates the previous site – like some government entity goes in and they're like, shut it down. It can't be real. It doesn't fit the narrative. But I mean, Good luckily job. the news gets out sometimes, but yeah, there's no way it's been rewritten. It's been corrupted. It's been perverted, all that crazy stuff, which is why I think along with the flowering of human consciousness, um, there is a huge influx of interdimensional beings, alien sightings, extraterrestrial anything spirit guides god jesus whatever you want to call it deities the uprising of deity worship is back again witchcraft all of that um it's all coming out because i think it like everything is just so tired of being suppressed it's just here we are you know it'd be true that makes sense 
I mean, it makes sense to me, but I'm always observing and not attaching and evolving my research over and over and over. So even my favorite part about having this show, it's kind of like a diary for myself in a way, because if I wanted to go back and be like, well, what was I talking about in, you know, 2021, season one, season two, da 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 da, da I can go on and I'll be like, oh, I remember the research that made me think that, but now... You know, I continue to open my mind and expand more. And I have times where I really need a lot of integration time in prayer, <laughs> right? I'm like, mm-hmm. all right, I found something that gave me uh, some weird cognitive dissonance. Jesus, Yeshua, I don't even know what I want. I don't even know what I'm supposed to call you anymore after I found out the old text, right? So I'm just like, I'm going to take some time on this and, you know, just really sit with myself and I'll write about it and I'll journal it and I'll timestamp it and I'll... I just, I love the evolution that can go with the growing process if you allow yourself to do it. Um, Again, I'm not interested in interviewing like any mean people that want to like eradicate humanity. Like that's not my thing. When I say there's a place for everybody, I mean for all the nice people and the open-minded ones that want to grow. You know, (coughs) all the other, all the other people that don't want to grow. I know I'm your dirty little secret. Thank you for listening. We love you too. And we're here for you. (laughs) You know, like, have you ever thought like, especially your book, right? Like if somebody like saw your book and they're like, oh, we're not supposed to talk about this or believe in this, but you know, they bought your book because that intuitive curiosity is just too much to pass up. So they're like, I must, and it's got to still feel good, even though. I mean, you'll never know, but you know that there are people out there that are like, oh, this book or this podcaster, it's my guilty pleasure. I can't tell people, but I love it so much. And my curiosity is so fed listening to this stuff. It gets me so excited because I was that same kid too. And now that I get to like meet people like you and put out content like that, it's even better because I'm just like, expand, grow my friends. That's what we're here for. Have fun. See an alien, go on an ayahuasca trip, drink the tea, the proper <laughs> tea, not the Kool-Aid that that weird guy poisoned. Like, none of that. None of that. Okay, so um, I'm trying to think of some other stories. So is the Bermuda Triangle the same story as the UFO in the middle of the ocean? Like, those are conjoined. Okay, so those are two different stories? Take it away, George. Take it away. <laughs> we were on the middle, of the, literally the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. There was nothing around that we didn't know about, and the forward lookout reported seeing a light at the horizon, or just inside the horizon, about eight miles away, on the port side. So I grabbed my binocular, looking at it. I report it too, and. Radar has nothing. There's no report. They can't find anything in compact systems. They, nothing there according to them. Well, I'm looking at it, and it looks like a, your classic disc UFO. And we thought it was a conning tower for a submarine. But it started going back and forth like this. Just right above the water. You can see the water moving the width of it, but... There was nothing coming out. There was nothing connecting the object to the water. No sound. And we watched it for about five minutes. And all of a sudden, it got really, really bright. And poof, it was gone up in the air. Straight up. We had nothing in our arsenal or any other country that we can do that. Mm Mm-mm. I love the stories when they start going, you know, in a way that, like, we literally can't do it no matter. Yep. Deep, deep, deep. Um, we didn't really think anything about it. I never even thought about it until I started writing a book. And I was like, wait a minute. That was a UFO. <laughs> That's funny. That's funny. Don't you love when those memories wife, just sit there, though, waiting to come Chicago. back up? Huh? So don't you love when those memories just sit in there waiting to pop back up, though? You're like, oh, oh yeah. some bitch. There it's that is. Well, me and my wife are coming back to Chicago. We're 30,000 feet in the air. We can see the clouds. She sees something. She says, what is that? Now I look, and there's a silver cigar out 
I don't know, several miles away from us, but it's flying beside the aircraft. We can see it. It's just as plain as day. And she bent over to get her camera to get a picture of it, her phone. And when she did it, it went real bright and it disappeared. Yep. And she goes, where'd it go? I said, I don't know. I don't know. They didn't tell me, honey. They didn't report, yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Which I think it's cool, like, sci-fi, right? Like, we can, we'll just go back to all that. A lot of the stuff that um, they either have as their own technology or, like, forces that they're fighting against, like, all the invisibility and the cloaking devices and all of that. Oh, I 100% believe in that. Like, oh, we have the technology to do cloaking. Absolutely. But the fact that whether it's called blah, 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 security for blah, 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 whatever, right? Um, the fact that we know that there are militarized technologies and technical advances that are kept from us and we paid for that shit, okay? Kind of annoying. Kind of annoying, in my opinion. Um, I can see why they don't let people know, because I did spend time in the military. So I can see why they wouldn't, because there's some things you don't want the enemy to find out. See, and on, I get that. The problem is, I got more trust issues with the government than I ever did with my ex-boyfriends. Okay, <laughs> and it is their fucking fault, because I've been a good little girl and they still are just acting all kind of weird, you know, acting like I can't be trusted. You know what I'm saying? Like, that's that's my whole thing. Like, I get, like, the enemy thing. You're absolutely correct. But I don't know. I mean, I've talked to people about the secret space program. I've talked to people about their alien abductions, the Galactic Federation, contracts with extraterrestrials. And now there's this whole big movement on extraterrestrial movies. And now you got a lot of these UFO experiencers talking to other dimensional beings, how they're saying the governments are going to make it look like there's an extraterrestrial attack, but it's actually just stuff that the government has made to like fear monger the people. And I don't want to believe any of it because I vibe a lot higher than all of this bullshit. But since we're talking about it, this shit is real and it's out there and people are experiencing it. And then they're told they didn't experience it. And there's NDAs going around where you're not allowed to talk about it, which is what surprised me that you're like, yeah, I was in the Navy and we had this experience. I'm like, I'm really surprised they they weren't like, okay, sign this paper and never talk about it again. Thanks. You know, and then they just have like this big collection like... Did you know, right before Kennedy was shot, that he sent papers up to that government we're not supposed to know about it and was like, you have to tell the people about UFOs. And then he got shot. So there's a conspiracy (laughs) theory that Kennedy got shot because he was actually for the people and was like, you have to let the people in on what's going on in their country and in the world. And they're like, oh shit, he's not a puppet, get rid of him. You know that that's out there? Because I believe that more than some two bullet shit on some grassy knoll. I'll totally oh, no, do that. No. There's a lot more to that than what anybody knows, that's for sure. Yeah, definitely. And then don't even get me started on Marilyn Monroe's journey where she talked about all the stuff that Kennedy was going to tell everybody, so then they made it look like she was a drug addict when she wasn't, and somebody stole her diary, and still that's the big conspiracy too. Even though, mm-hmm. I mean, she really did she did love her men. I'll give her that. Um, but yeah, where's the, the fucking head, diary, mama. man? And the president, it's kind of a problem. <laughs> yeah, you know, happy birthday, Mr. President. Yeah, like your wife's not going to pick up on those vibes. Good job, Marilyn. <laughs> Good job. Well, what she was sleeping with him and his brother. Him so, and his brother. Know. And then there was some actor, I can't think of his name. They had like a 20-year affair, which I don't know. I mean, I'm a big, I'm a big believer in just like... Some people are together and they're not in love and some people aren't together and they are in love. Like I'm some weird, creepy, hopeless romantic sometimes. And I'm like, I know you're married, but there's God's love and there's the human made love. And then there's unconditional love and there's conditional love. And then I go back to, I don't really know anything. So, you know, (laughs) I'm also ordained and I love marrying people, um, especially just like, Non-denominationally is probably my favorite, so we can keep it on the level of, like, the bride and the groom getting married under unconditional love, which, at the end of the day, is God's love, whatever you call God. 
So, um, yeah, I just kind of like to keep it free flowing in a sense where I'm just like, are you, are you good? Are you kind? Do you know what unconditional love is? Do you operate out of unconditional love? Cool. We can be friends. Your friends are my friends. Are you a dick? <laughs> I've got, I've got quite the bite as well. I try not to use it anymore, but it happens, you know? So, I understand. Yes. Yes. You seem like you're a kind, sweet North Carolina man, but I feel like you're also like, get off my property if you if you get pissed off. I can be very bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we all have it in us. It's fine. It's fine. I just want to make sure we're on the same page. Um, uh, okay, so with all your research that you've done about your book, um, what is the reason for you like consolidating all this information and putting it in a book? Like if you, if I wanted to read your book, what is your intent for me to read your book? Enjoy. Enjoy. I, I, when I was young, our, our older people, our grandparents, our parents would tell us stories about the area we grew up in. And of course, as kids, we have to go check it out and see what's there. Whether it be a ghost or whether it be lights, you know, or whatever, we're going to go check it out. Well, that's my intent. I want to, you to read the stories in your area or from your state or somewhere that you want to go check out and go, hey, this looks interesting. Let's go check it out. And it's nothing more than something for people to enjoy. That's all it is. You literally just flooded my mind with all the stories that we used to get told of where I lived. And I thank you so much for all of that because now I got to tell you one, George. Okay. So there was an old Girl Scout camp that we used to go to when we were kids. Um, eventually, I think the state took it over, so then like people would rent it out. So our church would always rent it out for our retreats. But there's a graveyard next to it where the prom queen and the fattest man in the world were buried. So the prom queen, I think the story goes... She never made it to prom or she died after a prom or something like that. But the road that she died on, people would see this girl walking on the side of the road, not an apparition, a full-on human in a prom dress. And I think she might be bloody or she wasn't bloody when she got in the car, but then she did turn bloody at the end, which like then made them know that she was a ghost. It's one of those. And it's been told for so many years. That's why I'm telling two different versions because I've heard two different versions over time. But basically, we stayed at the, um, it was for the church camp this time. We got told the campfire stories at Girl Scout camp. And then we were old enough to um, go and explore the cemetery, or at least talk about that we were going to go explore the cemetery. So all of us as the group went to the cemetery and like we went to the girl's grave. I've always been super big on paying respects to people's graves, but I've also seen dead people and floating orbs in cemeteries since I was a kid. So I was like, yep. I just pick up flowers, put them back on the grave, and I would actually sing to the dead. That was where I first started singing was the cemeteries. <laughs> so, um, yeah, so I'm with like this group of like adolescent church kids. So we all just like to pick on each other and, um, we're like, okay, we're going to go to the cemetery, and then after all the adults go to bed, we're going to grab our sleeping gear, and whoever can stay in the cemetery the longest um, without just, like, freaking out, you know, just basically gets to say they slept in the cemetery with the prom queen. Um, so when it's light out and you make that pact, you're like, I got this. I can do this. It's totally fine. And then <laughs> we start walking to the cemetery where the fog is moving over the cemetery, right? And you're like, like all of us walked up there, right? And we're like, yeah, we're not doing this. There's, yeah, there's no way. I mean, you could feel it all over your body. I mean, again, it's a cemetery, it's the dead. Um, but there was no way in hell I was staying in that cemetery anyways. And I wish that I would have known back in the day to be like, you know, nobody can follow me, nobody can attach to me at that time because I definitely think a couple of us took some friends with us when we went. But I oh, yeah. still, I still remember, like, man, friends, parents telling that story from the area, grandparents. Mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, there's a couple other ones I was thinking of, where we would all like we would go take pictures in cemeteries, and it was the little 35 where you just yeah. click, 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 and then send them in and wait for your photos to come back. Um, so we would get our photos back and we'd like see all of the orbs everywhere, like over the gravestones and colors and shapes. 
And then we had a lot of um, like abandoned old schools and old houses where people would claim that they've seen apparitions at the top of the house. So we'd go up to it. Uh, again, I'm energetically sensitive to this stuff. So I would be the most scared because I felt it more than my friends. And um, I, it would be like, do you want to be the lookout by yourself or are you coming with us? And I'm like, damn it. Damn it, I don't want to go in this place. And there was one, I think it was... In Barrie, Illinois, there was an old schoolhouse. I don't know if it burned down or they finally demolished it. But when we were kids, we were there. And it was all boarded up because kids had, like, went up and, like, fallen through the floorboards and stuff trying to go see some weird shit. I made it halfway up that staircase, and I said, y'all got to be out of your mind. And I ran out of the schoolhouse and refused to go up there. I was like, nope, nope. Whether they're ghosts or crackheads up here, it ain't for me. I'm so sorry. This is just not how I want to live my life. <laughs> <laughs> so you said to this day you still haven't had like a really you haven't had I don't want to be like a demonic encounter but you haven't had anything that like made the head the hair stand up on the back of your head like oh this ain't good something's bad something bad is here oh yeah yeah I went uh, same guy that had the house with the shadow creature and the cages yeah cages he built into the wall there used to be a tuberculosis hospital. Oh, God, those are the worst. I can't even watch those documentaries anymore. As you, as you got close to it, you could just feel the pressure on your mm-hmm. chest. And this to say, well, I only went over one. It was, it was bad. Yeah. Um, all the ghost TV shows about the old mental institutions and all of those, even... There's, like, a haunted house that, like, does a whole haunted house in an old mental institution. And, like, if you make it through, they'll give you, I don't know, like, 100 bucks or something and, like, bragging rights. Not for me, dude. Like, I am so sensitive. And I'm not like, oh, they're going to attach to me and I'm going to get possessed or anything. I'm like, I feel bad for these souls that are trapped here. And, yeah, you can feel it. Yeah, and you can feel it in your body and... I don't know if I'm a food or an energy source, so they're like, hey, <laughs> help us. Like, I'm not that good at my gifts yet. I'll get there. But, oh, man, even when I see them on TV, it just makes my heart hurt. I mean, just empathetically, I can't believe you had to go through that. Oh, and don't even get me started on the tunnel systems under those places. Ugh. Ugh. No, yeah. People that find tunnels and go, let's go explore this tunnel. No. They probably rolled so many dead people out there. So many people got killed. Oh. Uh, oh. I, agree. I agree with you on that. Uh. Okay. Well, then I want to tell you my creepy story, and we'll wrap it up unless you have anything else. Besides, I want people to know where they can get your book. I know they can get it on Amazon, and I'll link it below. But we'll get there. So my creepy story for you, George. And I also, okay. I, I actually, like, want your opinion on this, too. Like, maybe what you would have done. Or, oh, shit, that's messed up. So I went to uh, nail school when I was younger. Like, nails. Pretty nails, right? So um, I already knew that it was going to be a haunted school because it was a haunted part of the town. And I was like, okay, well, probably going to see some shit. It's cool. Nobody believes me when I tell them I see shit. That's fine. I don't want to believe it either, but whatever. So I go in this building, and I already, like, feel you know, stuff around, but I don't really have any clue of like what it actually is at the time. Right. I'm like super beginner is what I would say. So there is big classrooms, other classrooms, and there's this huge hallway that splits and there's like a ramp that goes up and like comes around. And the way that the carpet just goes up the ramp, you clearly know Like, this was not meant to be a school for nail technicians, cosmetology, or jewelry making. Because they just shoved all this shit in a building and was like, come on, folks, let's educate you, right? So, so I, like, it's my first day there. There's a bunch of, like, other students coming in and out. And there's a vending machine and a soda machine up on, like, that second level ramp. And I was like, hey... Where's a girl get some snacks around here if you're going to keep me here all day, right? So they're like, so all the students with the shit-eating grin on their face are just like up that ramp, like out that door, up that ramp. Immediately, like every like hair on my body was like, something something (laughs) fucked up is up there, Shy. 
But I was like, let's go investigate. Come on, Scoobs. So I go out there and I walk up this ramp. Immediately, the hallway is fucking cold. And I'm walking up there and I was like, this is trippy, this is trippy, this is trippy. So I was like, let's just get my vending snacks and just use the momentum from the ramp to run faster back down, right? You ever that <laughs> kid that ran through the dark really fast? Because I totally was. Still am. 31. And I'm like, oh my God, it's dark. Um, so I'm standing at the vending machine and the light starts flickering above my head. I was like, great. Now I know not only is it not a being of light, but it's, it's an energy sucker, right? Like I grew up on Charmed, so I was ready for this shit. <laughs> so there's a hall, there's like a hallway with just like office doors for days down there. So it, it had like the old paneling lights, you know, like the long oh. bob LED lights. Yeah. So it's probably, I don't, it's a long freaking hallway, dude. It's long. And the light at the end would flicker and go out. And then the light would flicker and go out. You know, like it's literally absorbing all of the energy from the light. So I can see this thing walking towards me and I'm like, B one one. I'm not leaving my fucking Cheetos. You know what I mean, man? Like I'm hungry, you know, like I haven't, nobody told me anybody got attacked yet from an entity. So I was like, okay. So like the moment that like I got my hand into the vending machine and like pulled it out, I turn around. It has like three lights to walk down the hallway. So I can see he's about 10 to 12 feet in front of me. Um, so I run my ass down the ramp and it, and I was like, I just, when were one of you bitches going to tell me you got something trippy <laughs> living up there? And they all started rolling. They're like, sorry, we couldn't tell you. They're like, not everybody experiences it. And we wanted to see if you knew what was up there. And I said, knew what was up there. There's some evil shit up there. I was like, you gotta be freaking kidding me. I was like, I'm not going up there ever again by myself. Cause again, it's the only form of food unless you like went out and got yourself. So I was like, I'm going to need someone to escort me up there next time. So it obviously became like the topic of thing where I'm like, I'm going to go home and research this building. I'm going to find out what happened here. Clearly there's been murder. Clearly there's been mass murder. Clearly there's just been something so freaking dark. And at the time, like when you think of how bright your spirit is, right? Like you're a food source. So I was like, right. not really interested in being a food source. So study your enemies is my best thing that I could come up with. So, um, the lady that I was going to work at the nail salon with her son was five years old and super open, saw everything. And she's like, I'm going to bring my son in and I'm not going to tell him anything. And I'm just, I'm, Cheyenne, I'm going to let you walk him up the stairs and, you know, work with him. And I was like, great. Because again, I could see it in my third eye. This kid can see apparitions. Like he can see the guy man like bleh, in front of us. So I was like, super great. Um, not to mention both the hallways go down both ways. So you don't know which hallway the guy's coming down. But he usually stays at the very back office by the exit which is creepy which shows me he had to have murdered people so anyways um I want to make sure I tell the story right yep okay great so her son comes in and I was like hey do you want to do this like are you okay with this and he's like oh I love this stuff he's like it's fine it's totally great so we open the door and immediately he goes oh whew. And he comes out in the hallway and he goes, why are there so many like cows and pigs and horses? Well, previously, before she brought her kid in, when I did research on the building, the building was actually an old slaughterhouse. So they slaughtered pigs, cattle, horses, you fucking name it, it was slaughtered. And the top of the ramp was the kill floor. And then when they would cut the carcass up, they would roll the carcass down that ramp that all of us walked up every day. So when you went out in this hallway, it was thick energy, right? And it wasn't the bitches in the room stinking the place up. It was a million animal deaths on top of the story that we're about to get into. I cannot find any newspaper evidence on this this is all clairvoyant evidence that has come through and my own experiences tied into it 
So, me and this boy start to walk up the ramp. And I stand there, and I close my eyes, and the guy starts walking behind me in the hallway. And um, the boy looks past me, and he goes, oh, he's angry. And I said, very angry. And he's like, he doesn't want us up here. And I said, I know he doesn't. And I also don't want him up here when I'm trying to come get my snacks. So can we just come to some like nice agreement where I'm like, hey, I'll get my snacks and leave you alone. You quit coming up and trying to creep me out. And the boy was like, okay, he's getting closer. And he's talking to the boy and he's coming for me. So I feel all of the hair stand up on the back of my body and I can see this guy this entity come up to the side of my face and sniff along my ear and breathe on my neck. And he's got, <laughs> he's got just the craziest fucking looking eyes. He's in some old, like, lo- like he worked at the slaughterhouse, right? And he told the little boy that he slaughtered animals during the day and slaughtered people at night in the same building. And nobody knows to this day that he did this. And I was like, this is awesome. Now there's a bunch of like unconfirmed deaths in this old slaughterhouse. And like, nobody knows about it. Like we're unearthing shit that, I mean, I'm 21 at the time. I'm really not going to turn into Scooby and the gang at the point, right? I'm just like, I can't believe this has happened. This is tripping me out. So basically like we were like, hey, we're going to get out of here. We don't mean any disrespect, but like, this is a school Like, there's going to be kids here. Like, we didn't want anybody to get hurt because this isn't the first time this entity had come up and, like, done stuff. So, immediately after, like, I was exhausted. Like, fell asleep on the way home from work. I wasn't driving. I was a passenger. I have to note that. And I went home, and I passed out, just, like, crash landed like I'd been up for five days. And I remember waking up, but I wasn't awake And I remember someone going, shy, shy, wake up, wake up. He's here, wake up. He's here. And they just kept saying, wake up. He's here. So then I looked back on my bed and the guy was in front of my bed and he was just staring at me like this. And then I woke up in real life because like my guide or whoever was like, girl, wake up. Um, I woke up and I could like feel the energy like clear and dissipate out of my room immediately. Like it felt really dense and heavy. Like it was his energy. Right. And then it was freaking gone. So I was like, okay, you, (laughs) you want to follow me home? You want to freak me out while I'm sleeping? I was like, I'm not fucking done here. I thought I came for a nail degree, but here we are. Here we are. So I go back up there and I was like, what do you want? I was like, you're not going to follow me home. I said, I swear to God, I will bring somebody in here and just exercise your ass. I was like, so what do you want? So he came through my Claire audience and he told me that he was stuck in limbo and he wanted out. And like, he's stuck here. He's stuck in this building. He's stuck with what he did. Um, I think there was something about like something took over him and made him do it. So then I reached out to the wrong Christian person in my life because at that time I actually believed they were helpful to me. And um, she was like, oh my God, Satan's coming for you. We have to pray for you. All this crazy shit just went down a whole demonic level. And she's like, demons try to act like good people and all this stuff. And I was like, okay, well, I was wanting to know more about like limbo and you know, why, like why I would be able to talk to an entity, whether it was of light or dark. I said, I'm not going to try to get the guy out of limbo. That's really not my forte. But this woman, like one, like refused to believe I had the experience, but believed I was trying to be taken over by a demon, so to speak. It was kind of weird. So I was like, okay, um, can we get back to the fact that I talked to a being that isn't physically incarnated and did a lot of really evil stuff? Can we, can we elaborate on that? Which, I mean, we couldn't, and we quit talking. And I love her. I love everybody, right? But that really wasn't the guidance I was looking for in my life. So um, I went back up with, um, I would say, Jesus in my, in my pocket. And I said, hey, guy, listen, um, 
I'm really glad you came through and like confessed all your stuff to me. I said, so apparently you slaughtered a lot of animals and apparently you slaughtered a lot of people. I said, I have no proof that this happened. I said, but I am going to need you to stay away from me. I do walk in the light of Jesus Christ. I am of God's light. I am of God's love and I only work for God. Um, so if you need someone to help you get out of quote unquote limbo, it will not be me. You will not come around me. You will not come around my classmates. You will stay back in your office and for the love of God, just like stay away from us. Do not make me bring in a priest because I will do it. And then, uh, we didn't, I personally, and none of the other students had any issues after that, that I know of, but after we had like such a big, like moment so to speak oh. about it it just kind of like it kind of like took the mystery away and all of that away and then after that more we mainly focused on like the animal spirits that were there and we would be like oh hey horsey hey cow hey you know and we really just focused like on the light of the situation but when I got to that school the only thing that anybody could focus on was the dark entity up there and I truly believe that he fed off of that curiosity and them going up and like, you know, tinkering with them. So I was like, I see you, I love you, but you gotta go. And that was the only way that like the whole thing just kind of would, like I was able to graduate, <laughs> right? Cause I was still there having to learn. But putting yourself in my shoes, what the hell would you, would you even think having that experience, even seeing something like that for the first time, especially being so dark? I've probably been a little freaked out when I first saw it. Yeah. But I'm kind of a bonehead. And uh, <laughs> I don't scare real easy. Especially from, I mean, snakes, yes. Everything else, no. Snakes, yes. <laughs> I'll give you I've that. been shot at so many times and everything else. I've died once. So nothing really bothers me. Mm -hmm. And even... I've seen, like I said, I've seen the bad spirits over there, and I've been to the hospital, and it, it, it bothered me, but it didn't scare me. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just, I know what's on the other side, so I don't let things like that worry me. I am better at it now, I'll give you that. This was over 10 years ago, and I was definitely like, is this shit happening right now? Am I, I losing my mind? Yeah. Yeah. We, we had a ghost, and... Well, I used to live. I had to go. This was after my first divorce. And uh, she was wonderful. She she was great with the kid. My daughter, I woke up crying one night. I walk in out here. And she's patting the blanket. And you see the blanket moving. My daughter quieted down and went back to sleep. So, and she would, she if she didn't like you there, she let you know. Mm. I had a girlfriend that come in and was staying there. And she tormented the crap out of her. It was hilarious. That is I put funny. things on the table, and I was at work, and I get this frantic phone call, and she's freaking out. She's screaming on the phone. Said, Calm down. Tell me what's going on. And the pennies were going across the table, landing on their edge on the floor, rolling over, popping, turning 90 degrees, and rolling over and falling heads up. And she did every single thing, and she made a perfect circle with them. Oh, I bet that would freak her out. You know, I have actually had a thought, right? Like, I was like, okay, so can can you pause me walking into the light really quick where I can just go, like, tinker with some people, like, really quick, you know? Like, kind of like that, like the pennies or, like, go throw a picture off the wall, like, <laughs> um, But obviously, like, that's not, like, unconditional love thoughts, but we all have them, right? <laughs> Um, but I did, I'm like, I think I would be a really funny ghost. Like, hmm, who, who would I go hang out with? Who, you know, like Cody, like who would I help go drive? And then I think that's why I like, like walk in the light and then you get to come back and help your friends. Like whether you believe in life guides, spirit teams, just your loved ones coming around you being of service for your physical incarnation. Um, I'm a big believer in all of the loved ones coming in and helping us in whatever regard we need them to. Um, yeah. But I wonder why I'm here helping someone if I can just go pick on someone too for fun, <laughs> you know? Yeah. 
you know? Kind of like that one. She's like, okay, let's pat the baby to sleep. And she's like, oh God, Brenda's here. <laughs> All right, grab the pennies. We're going to hush this woman up real quick, <laughs> you know, just to have a little fun with it. But yeah, there's a time for that. Just like you. I mean, I have not had the experience of the near death experience of like seeing the other side, but, uh, my grandma, my great grandma came back to me too, to let me know that there's more. Right. And that's always been a really comforting thing to me. I've done really good with um, working on my issues with grief for um, people that are still living and not in my life anymore. And then people that have passed away, um, whether you saw it coming or whether you didn't, I've really, really worked on that because I, I work more with the other side, again, being clairvoyant and clairaudient um, and coming into it and the belief in your own and like undoing your subconscious programming about it is the best way I could say has been um, very beneficial to a lot of things that I've seen and a lot of experiences that I've had. And the more that I even talk to people like you, it really helps solidify that there's a lot more going on in the world than all of us were um, told to believe. So that's true. Yeah, I love it. So again, your book is called Legends, Myths, Monsters, and Ghosts, the USA edition. There it is. Yes. And you can get it on Amazon. You also have a website that I can plug you in on. Um, so you are publishing two more books and then your podcast is going to ramp up again. Is that correct? It is, but it may turn into a, a video podcast. Hey. I'm working on a deal on the side here. Hopefully it'll work out. Well, I am up for any of it. I love your stories. Um, oh, what is it? Odd and Unusual Tales. That is, that's the perfect enticing title for me to click on when I'm going on a road trip. So I look forward to listening to it in whatever format you release it out into the world. And I really, really appreciate you coming on the show today. I have thoroughly enjoyed it. Thank you very much. Yes. Well, stick around for just a minute longer because Vitality Exposed is actually going to bring us a track from Neo Vi. It's called Let Me Go off of his album Closure. So thank you again, and I look forward to talking to you again, George. Thank you. This is the Hoosier Media Network, your home for podcasting.